everyone. My name is Alex de Leport. I'm assistant professor at uh, Université Paris-Saclay in France. And um, today I will try to introduce you to surplus quantization. Um, so um, first, we'll have to talk about what is quantization. So usually what we mean by quantization um, in, in uh, mathematical physics is the bringing together some classical dynamics, so um, systems of ODEs with typically position and momentum, um, associate to this classical picture, a quantum picture, so a self-adjoint operator on a Hilbert space or a sequence of self-adjoint operator on a sequence of Hilbert spaces. And uh, how we do this and how we analyze the, the links between the classical picture and the quantum picture is usually called semi-classical analysis or microlocal analysis. So I'll start with um, one of the most uh, simplest uh, classical dynamics, one of the most ubiquitous example, which is the 1D harmonic oscillator. Um, so I have two um, independent variables, the position x and the momentum psi of, of um, some, some mass spring system. And um, the the dynamics, if you draw the, the picture in phase space, in 2D space, is so simple that you could explain it to, to a child. So basically what you do is um, you rotate, you start with some point and you rotate at fixed um, speed um, uh, around the origin. Um, you usually don't see this picture in real life. What you see is the projection um, to the horizontal component, so the projection on the on the x uh, axis, and so there's a, the ODE is that the second derivative of x is minus x, and the solution, well, you can't explain it to a small child. Now you need some um, trigonometry. Um, um, the most usual way to to consider the quantum equivalent of this is um, to consider the associated Schrödinger operator and Schrödinger equation. So um, the semi the self-adjoint operator I'm interested in is um, this operator acting on L2 of R. And, and so this is the now 1D linear equation. And um, um, I've um, written down a formula for the um, eigenstates of the eigenfunctions of this operator. And they're given by the Hermit functions, which are some some polynomials which uh, you can study using recursive for formulas uh, times a Gaussian. And at this stage, um, you can ask yourself a very natural question: um, What lies here? Is there something in the quantum phase space which is simpler and which, when projected down somehow to the x-axis, produces the Hermit polynomials? And that something presumably is much simpler than, than, the, than the Hermit polynomials. Um, perhaps you cannot explain it to a child, but in a way, uh, in a way it should be simpler. Uh, the answer to this natural question um, was um, found by Bargman. Um, so the idea is to um, not use the, the, the usual Hilbert space for surplus quantization, which is an L2 space of the, of the physical um, positions, but to consider a space of functions on the, on the phase space R2n. So the idea is you think of R2n as being Cn, um, and you consider a, a space of L2 holomorphic functions. So of course, um, holomorphic functions are seldom L2. So you had a weight, you had an exponential weight, um, and there's a parameter in this exponential weight, and you must think that this parameter is the inverse um, semi-classical parameter. Now, this space, this subspace of L2 is a closed subspace. Um, everything is nice. It has a reproducing kernel. So this pi n of x, y defines a function, um, and it defines a an integral operator, which is a, an orthogonal projection from L2 of Cn to Bn, which I'm going to call the Zeger or Bergman projector. 
Um, there's a simple formula for this. Um, and um, note that um, for fixed x and y, as n tends to infinity, this decay is exponentially fast because this is imaginary part, right? It doesn't count. And um, this is strictly strictly a negative quantity a within an exponential, so it kills the, the polynomial factor. So pi n is not a local operator, but it's almost local in a sense. Um, anyway, you can interpret this um, Bargman space as the, the eigenspace, as the first Landau level for the, the magnetic Laplacian with constant field. Um, so uh, what I'm saying is that, well, holomorphic functions are um, satisfy d bar equals zero, and um, d bar is not a self adjoint operator, but d bar star d bar modulo this weight um, is a self adjoint operator, and the, the, the kernel of this space, the lowest level of this magnetic Laplacian, is precisely this Bargman space. Um, okay, so this is going to be my space of quantum states, and um, I can now define toplitz operators on this Bargman space, and they're going to quantize the, the classical dynamics. So um, the recipe is when I'm given a function, um, which is going to be an observable or an energy from Cn from R to n to R, say the function which yields the harmonic oscillator, so modulus of the squares. You quantize it into an operator on Bn, self adjoint operator by setting the, the matrix element. So given u and v in the Bargman space, you, you, you want that the bracket Tn of f between u and v is just the integral of f u v. Now this makes sense precisely because f is a function on phase space and u and v are L2 elements in the space, in the, in the phase space. So this integral um, is natural. An equivalent way of writing this, and it's why it's called toplets operators, is to, to write that Sn is the composition um, Zegel projector multiplication operator by F Zegel projector. Um, all right, so what happens if you start with uh, this function Z maps to Z squared? Um, well, the, the operator you find, um, want to make the correct um, uh, integration by parts, is n minus 1 times holomorphic derivative times multiplication by z. And in a way, just as in usual quantization, you have a function of x and psi, and you transform it into an operator by changing each psi into h bar derivative. And uh, that's what transforms, say, a modulus of psi squared into h squared Laplace operator. Just like this, here we replaced z by multiplication by z and z bar by n minus 1 derivative. So it gives you a hint that n minus 1 is going to be the semi classical parameter. Um, the eigenstates of this operator are very simple. Well, start with the monomial zk. You multiply it by z, you differentiate, you, you, you fall down on your feet. So um, the eigenstates of this operator are indeed much simpler than the Hermit functions. It's a monomial times your exponential weight. Um, now, this definition of quantization works very well um, with any function which is bounded everywhere um, to produce bounded self adjoint operator. And if, say, it's polynomial, it has polynomial growth and uh, produces a sequence of. Um, non-bounded self-adjoint operators, but with a dense domain. Um, and very importantly, um, whatever f and g are sufficiently regular functions, then you can compute by integration by parts using the formula for Sn that I gave you previously. You can compute the commutator between Tn of f and Tn of g. And um, at, at dominant order, so you gain a factor n, and at dominant order, what you find is i, well, i because it's um, uh, anti-symmetric matrix, 
um, it's i times Tn of the Poisson bracket between f and g. And this is precis precisely what we ask for um, in quantization. Um, we ask for the, the bracket of operator to reflect the bracket of functions because that's how we know that the quantum evolution um, will be similar to the to the classical evolution. Once we have this, we have an Egorov theorem and things like this. Um, all right, so what's the point, right? We already know how to quantize things on R2D. We have pseudo differential operators. So why talk about this? Um, first of all, there's a well-known transformation, this projection on the x-axis that I talked to you previously, the Bargman transform, which conjugates the Bargman space and then to an of, of Rn. Basically what this Bargman transform does is to match the, the Herbert bases of the harmonic oscillator one with each other. Um, it's a well-known integral kernel, the kernel is on Wikipedia. Um, if you, It's essentially a wave packet transform, so an inverse wave packet transform. If you know about the FBE transform, uh, fourier bros diagonal it's the same up to up to a change of gauge. Um, and you can try to conjugate this um, toplitz quantization with the Bargman transform. And what you find is indeed a Vi pseudo differential operator with semi classical parameter n minus 1. So indeed h is n minus 1 once and for all. Um, and it's the uh, Vi quantization of f uh, modified at scale um, n one half. And okay, I told you that toplitz quantization works for n infinity symbol, and Vi quantization certainly doesn't. And um, when you when you make this conjugation, uh, you recover a symbol which is in the class S one half one half. Uh, so you gain the power H one half each time you differentiate, and that's it's known to be the 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 worst possible um, differentiability scenario in which one can make sense of of by quantization and it checks out. Um, so using this formula, uh, you have a, a formal equivalence between between toplets and pseudo differential calculus. If you start with c infinity symbols, you can somehow invert this formula up to O of h infinity and uh, everything that works in one word works in the other world. Um, but why should we be interested in the toplitz world? Um, so three reasons. Um, the first is that it's formulated directly in phase space. You don't have to micro-localize. Um, if you study micro-support, etc. Micro-support means support. Um, toplitz quantization works for um, essentially bounded symbols. So uh, if you want to cut and paste things, it's much easier if you don't have to track all the derivatives. And um, uh, a consequence of the fact that it works for infinity symbols is that it's positive. Whenever f is positive, tn of f is positive. And that's a much, much more um, simpler statement than a Golding estimate. Um, you have sharper estimates. Uh, you have an equivalent of Pfefferman, Fong, or Medin estimates. But there, there are the you can prove them in toplitz quantization also. Um, but already at this stage, there are some advantages to toplitz quantization. All right, but now uh, I want to generalize this picture. So um, let's uh, let us look again at the definition of Bn. And okay, let's change things. Why did we take a Gaussian wave? We could just take any function psi, say convex, even pseudo convex. If you know what pseudo convex means, would work. Um, then associated with this wave psi, um, you can um, produce a new space B and psi. And so this is, again, the um, lowest lambda level of the associated magnetic Laplacian, where the magnetic field and the, and the metric depend on psi. You find, in, in particular, a new symplectic form, um, a new magnetic uh, field, which is uh, I dd bar of, of psi, which was the standard one in, in the case where psi is just z squared. Um, okay, now let's generalize again. So I take, say, a manifold, which is 
compact. And on this manifold, I have a notion of holomorphicity. So I have a complex structure. And on this space, I also have a, a symplectic form. And I want this symplectic form and the complex structure to be um, compatible with each other. Uh, what this means is that I can write omega as I dd bar of some function psi locally. So locally, I can build my, my um, Bargman spaces, my weighted Bargman spaces. And um, when I glue them together, the weight changes. So this produces a, a space HN um, of holomorphic things. It's not a space of functions, but it's close to it. It's a space of holomorphic uh, sections. Um, but we're going to see examples where we interpret them um, as, as natural holomorphic objects. Um, once you have this definition of the space of holomorphic thing is by gluing together the pieces, you can define um, the Zego pro Bergman projector and the toplet quantization exactly in the same way. So if you want to study this definition in a general setting, um, the first step is to study what, what this object looks like. And there's been, um, we, we know pretty, pretty well how, uh, how it behaves right now, um, but it has been a long story. And um, once you know this, then you can hope to study toplitz operators, which are given by, by composition with multiplication operators. Um, I'm going to give you two um, important examples of why um, it's, it's interesting, it's natural to look at this toplitz composition on, on some complex manifolds. The first example is the two-sphere. Um, if I'm working on the two sphere, this um, quantum, this quantum space, um, I can interpret it as the space of homogeneous degree n polynomials on C2. So this is a space of dimension n plus one. Um, and um, if I try to quantize, so there are, oops, there are um, three natural functions uh, reevaluated on S2, which are the coordinates of the embedding in R3. If I try to quantize these functions, I find what physicists call spin operators. So a triplet of operators such that when I um, try to commute two of them, I produce the third one up to this normalization. Uh, this plus cyclic permutations. I don't have a re remainder because this form, um, I mean, an exact algebraic setting. Um, the, the first person to, to see the spin systems as integral operators, so there was no general toplitz framework back in the day um, was a leap and it helped uh, a great deal in studying these operators in the in what's called the large spin limit so the large n limit uh, which is a semi-classical limit um, the the second uh, interesting example is the two torus so here hn uh, is direct comps so just as functions on the two torus um, are functions which are periodic both in x and psi, um, its quantization are, uh, say, distributions um, on R, which are periodic and whose h bar um, Fourier transform is also periodic. So um, this produces direct comps. So this space, as I mentioned, n. Um, and uh, for n even, um, not only can you quantize functions, but you can quantize um, some, some interesting symplectic change of variables on the torus. And for instance, the cat map. So what, what is the cat map? It's a linear map on the torus, um, which takes a cat picture and stretches it in one direction and, and pushes it in, in the other direction. And so it's, it's symplectic. Um, and it preserves some, some invariance, we can hope to quantize it. And indeed, um, that it's constructed uh, a sequence of unitary maps uh, on HN. And um, now, um, the classical picture is ergodic. So um, Dalit proved that CN exhibits quantum ergodicity. So almost all quantum eigenstates of this thing are spread around all over the torus. But, um, Fonon and Machin and Debye have proved that, and it, it's one of the, in fact, very few examples where we, we know that it doesn't work. 
uh, this system is not unique quantum ergodic. Uh, it's, it's a natural framework when you can do simple computations and uh, um, it's quite natural. Okay, so how does it work generally? Um, on CN, I told you we have a very explicit um, formula. And um, this pretty much works in, in, uh, in every situation. So if you have a smooth manifold, you can write your Zego kernel as something to the power n times a symbol plus you know, um, h infinity uh, symbol. So once you have this, as I said, um, you can do stationary phase. You can compose inverse topics operators. You can study a localization of eigenfunctions uh, modulo uh, h infinity for smooth doublet operators. Okay, I, I try to quickly um, give you two um, modern challenges for topless quantizations. Um, the first is the large dimension challenges. I told you about spin systems. Well, physicists want to study not only one spin, but a large number of spins interacting together. So, um, study the topless quantization of S2 to the D, where in the, in the thermodynamical limit, D tends to infinity. And um, you can't do um, symbol calculus in this limit. It just doesn't work because you have to take too many derivatives. Um, so you have to use the fact that topless quantization works well in the low regularity regime to, to, to do this. Um, I obtained some a priori estimates um, but um, I'm sure we can make them sharper. Um, we need some exponential estimates like in of this form, see next slide, to study the thermodynamic limit, and it's challenging. Um, we don't have any, we, we only have a very um, general result, and uh, what happens if uh, you study things at the bottom of the well, uh, et cetera. We, we don't know anything for the moment. The second challenge is that, uh, okay, even on a fixed manifold, <laughs> physicists, they want tunneling estimates. Um, all our computations that we, we deal up to any fixed power of h bar, they want O of e to the minus c. And, um, and for this, you need analytic regularity. So um, recently, um, I and another team obtained, and uh, the proof was simplified later on, that we know the Zego Bergman kernel up to this precision when the um, when everything is um, analytic, and we know how to compose an inverse operators, um, but we don't know how this works in large dimension. And um, we the analytic calculus is in its early stages, but there are many natural questions such as the spectrum of non-self-adjoint toplet operators. Um, and things like this. So uh, if you're interested in one of those challenges, uh, you can talk to me. Uh, okay, so that's all I had to say. Uh, so thanks for your attention. And thanks to the organizing committee of the Mathematical Congress of Americas for um, what I hope will be a very enjoyable conference.